Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this masterclass delivered by Acting Judge Norman Manoim on the interpretation of economic issues in competition law. This masterclass forms part of the lecture series in the Advanced Economics of Competition and Regulation module, which is part of the MCOM in Competition and Economic Regulation program at UJ. This degree is run by the Center for Competition Regulation and Economic Development. My name is Rina Dasnaya. I'm the program coordinator for this degree and a senior lecturer in the program. We're delighted to have uh, Norman speak to us this afternoon on the important topic of how courts interpret economic issues and competition law in line with the goals of efficiency, consumer welfare, and public interest. It is critical for economists to understand the challenges faced by the courts in applying the law to solve economic problems. For the students attending the session, being able to evaluate and present the economic evidence within the legal framework is important in their learning uh, in this field. With that, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Acting Judge Norman Manoim. Norman is currently an acting judge in the South Gauteng High Court. He was also the acting director of the Mandela Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand until January 2020. Before this, and this is the role most of you know Norman for, he served two terms as the chairperson of the Competition Tribunal of South Africa. He has been a full-time member of the tribunal since its inception in September 1999. Norman has been instrumental in shaping the trajectory of competition law and policy in South Africa. He was a member of the team that drafted the South African Competition Act of 1998 and has presided over numerous cases that have set important precedents and that have been studied uh, widely and debated globally. Prior to joining the Competition Tribunal, Norman was manager at Sheedle Thompson & Hayson, a Johannesburg-based uh, law firm. Norman is also a part-time lecturer in competition law at WITS. With that, uh, I'd just like to uh, give a few ground rules on how today's session will be uh, structured. Norman will deliver a lecture for around an hour. Uh, the audience is welcome to ask questions through the Q&A function. Uh, as always, we can't have uh, verbal questions asked, so please type out your questions in the Q&A box, and I will facilitate that after the session. There is also an upvote function, uh, which Zoom users now are very well aware of. If you have the same question as somebody else, please upvote it. Uh, so we can see what interest there is for that question. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Norman. Uh, we look forward to listening to your talk this evening. Thanks, Norman. Okay. Rina, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off talking about what are the objectives of competition law? In other words, what is it trying to achieve? Because if a judge is deciding a case or a tribunal member, depending on what body you're before, they have to have some understanding about what the objectives are because the objectives are like the compass of the system. They tell you where it's going. And unless you know where the compass is pointing, it's very difficult to decide what, which way a case should go. And as I'm going to elaborate on, it's very difficult to find out what the compass is in, in an area like competition law. Then I'm going to look at particular topics that are of interest, and I'm going to talk about the unhappy marriage between law and economics. And I'm going to look briefly at collusion, dominance, and mergers to show you how, as it were, the two different disciplines clash in some way and what, how their attempts are to resolve what they're doing. And finally, at the end, I'm going to, as it were, give some of my personal tips to economists, because I know a lot of you on this, on this call are economists or people who work with economists in litigation, as to how, from my own personal point of view, I think that economists sh should approach the job of giving, evi uh, giving evidence in cases. What should they do and what should they not do? But it's a purely personal, as it were, idiosync idiosyncratic approach to these issues. So that's more or less my roadmap of where I want to go in this, in this talk. So let me start off by saying that when I worked, as, as Rena has, has told you, I worked for 20 years for the South African Competition Authority, the Competition Tribunal, which is in, in the South African system, is an adjudicative body. So in the pre-COVID days, we would have live physical hearings. And every morning when we had a case, I would stand at the top of my, of my balcony and look down at people arriving to our courtroom to have their case decided. And both sides emerged from the parking lot. Both sides looked equally happy 
both sides were carrying their briefcase and smiling, but both sides were arguing a diametrically opposed uh, case before us. What would explain the fact that both had this, by their broad smiles, an expectation that they were going to win? Is it because the one side was completely deluded? Is it because one side or both sides thought that there were factual issues that might be resolved in their way? So if you took a criminal course uh, uh, analogy, did one side rely on an alibi and the other side wanted to refute the alibi and both felt confident that they would succeed in demolishing the other cases? But I would suggest whilst that both might be possibilities, they don't fully explain why both confidently feel that they would win. I would suggest that the greater and more, the more um, reasonable explanation is the nature of competition law as a contested terrain and uncertain terrain that led two different groupings up the stairs to believe they both could win. Now, let me start with a brief departure into, into constitutional law. Because competition law, like constitutional law, relies for a large part on very broad brush notions of, 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 of language, which could be interpreted by a court depending on which way it thinks the objects of the legislation go in different ways. In other words, relying on the same text, different adjudicative bodies could quite reasonably come to quite different outcomes. Let me give you an example starting with constitutional law. I want to start off with two well-known American cases. Under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, everybody is considered to be equal before the law. So you would think that with that, stat that, that mandate from the Constitution, that cases deciding equality would be decided in the same way, or largely in the same way, but that was not to be. So in 1896, in a well-known case called Plessy versus Ferguson, an African-American man was riding in a railway carriage reserved only for white people, and he was charged criminally for riding in the white person's carriage when there were in fact restricted black carriages for black people, a reminder for those who are South Africans on the Separate Amenities Act in, under apartheid. The court, he challenged the, the, the criminal uh, statute on the basis that it violated the 14th Amendment. If everyone is equal before the law, why do they travel in different railway carriages? And to his surprise, the court upheld the criminal statute and said that just because it is separate doesn't mean that it's unequal. Therefore, it didn't violate the 14th Amendment. 58 years later, in a historic case called Brown versus Board of Education, again, the US Supreme Court had to decide an issue of discrimination of separate amenities. This time it was in education. And the court came to the opposite conclusion. The court said, separate does not guarantee equality. In other words, what was happening here was two courts deciding on the same piece of legislation, the 14th of Amendment, and coming to entirely opposite conclusions. Why is that? Well, there could be many theories about why that is, but more than likely it is because the values in America changed since post-Reconstruction America, late 19th century, where courts were falling over backwards to appease the South after a terrible civil war in, in the 1860s to a post Second World War court in Brown versus Board of Education, where racism, uh, Nazism had figured recently and clearly and led courts to a different result. In the same way, I will argue is that courts interpreting competition legislation will come to different conclusions at different times based on different values in that particular uh, um, in, 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 at, in a, at a particular time. In other words, the text remains constant, but the, the way courts interpret the values changes over time. And in this way, antitrust law is very, very similar to constitutional law 
in interpretations being sensitive to the times in which they are um, in, in which they are considered. Now, the good yardstick for trying to measure this is the is the U.S. antitrust system. I am using the terms antitrust and competition uh, interchangeably. I'm, when I'm referring to the U.S., I'll use their word antitrust. Uh, it's a good measure to use the, the, the US because of the longevity of their system as compared to our systems here in, on, on the African continent. So you've got a period of time which, which to measure this kind of change that's, that's existed over the period of time. And it's just as well for me to just to read out to you from a book called The Antitrust Policy. It's written by these two authors, Carl Case and Donald Turner. Donald Turner was a former attorney general in charge of antitrust in the late 1960s. And they, and they say views on antitrust policy, perhaps even more than views on economic policy in other fields, rest heavily on judgments of value and on, 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 and on disputable conclusions about the way the economic mechanism works. They are writing this thing in 1959, in other words, 61 years ago, but that quote from Turner and Kazin could be said equally of today. In other words, this uncertainty, this call to what the values are, or has an equal claim today for the uncertainty as it was 61 years ago. Let me just give you a, what might account for that and what might not account for it. There are some schools of thought who say the reason particularly for changes in the Ameri U.S. attitude towards antitrust was because earlier courts who were predisposed to look at issues that were both economic and political underemphasized the economic aspect and push the social issues to the fore, and that later courts have in fact jettisoned this impure regard for political approach, the social approach, and relied on good old solid economics. However, this is not true, and in, in a very good article, uh, the uh, Harvard academic Louis Kaplow, who examines the earlier decisions, shows that they in fact are based on economics as well. So the fact that courts have that, that, that people now think that the courts have considered economics but didn't do so 50, 60 years ago or 100 years ago is simply not true. They always looked at economics, it's just that they looked at economics differently. So again, I would say what's, what's changed is not the fact that they now use economics, they always used economics. What's changed have been the, the, the views in, in a particular time and the social context in which that's happening. Now, if we look broadly at, before I get to the different schools of economics, it's important to situate them for that very reason in the, in the times that they occurred. So if we look at the original history of the US antitrust, starting with the Sherman uh, Antitrust Act in, in 18, 1870. The concern there was with private power. They were concerned that private power was depriving people, in a sense, ordinary citizens of what they called the appeal to republicanism. The appeal to republicanism was a populist feeling that big economic power, and one of the big concerns there was the standard oil uh, empire of, 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 of John Rockefeller. The concerns that private power was as dangerous for them as, as, as centralized political power. And Senator Sherman, the man who was responsible for guiding the act, in a famous, famous phrase calling back to the American War of Independence in the previous century said, if we'd fought for against an emperor in our, in our state, we must fight against an emperor in our economy. In other words, what he was saying, we had defeated King George in the UK in the previous century in the political realm. We don't want a king in our, in, in our economic realm either. That was the purpose of us getting our independence. So that's a profoundly political situation of antitrust law in, in, its, in its antecedents. Now, that informed many of the earlier decisions. 
uh, in American trust law, which were concerned about the small business, concerned about the, pro the power of, 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 of large firms. Then during 1950s, um, a, 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 there was an approach uh, by a, sc a school of economists who looked at the coincidence, the correlation between very, very uh, concentrated structures and the conduct of, of firms and how they performed. And so it was known as the structural conduct performance paradigm. And they said that, they, that highly concentrated industries were correlated with bad outcomes for consumers. And this was a dominant idea in the 1950s, which was to influence a lot of the court decisions in the early 60s. Almost a decade later, there was a school of thought emerging out of economists at the University of Chicago, which was then taken up by lawyers also based at the University of Chicago, what has become known as the Chicago School, uh, possibly the most influential school of thought that exists in antitrust up until today. The Chicago School rejected the work of the 50s and the structural conduct paradigm. And they said, based on their research, this did not hold. And that there was no direct correlation between high concentration and bad economic outcomes. And they began to influence the debate. They were very much shaped by the free market economic ideas of people like Milton Friedman and Aaron Director. And they brought these ideas into antitrust. And what it meant for them was a high degree of suspicion about the state's ability to intervene in markets effectively and a greater faith in the ability of markets to correct themselves. So it's not that they didn't see that there could be failures in the market, it's that they, they felt that market failure was cured by the markets themselves. So in other words, looking at something like excessive pricing, the attitude was there's no reason to have a prohibition against excessive pricing because if somebody prices excessively it is a signal to other people to enter into the new into a market and eventually the firm will no longer be able to charge those prices the market therefore will will, will self-correct or to put it in medical terms there's no need to go to a doctor to get antibiotics in other words to look to the state for a cure when staying in bed one or two nights you will cure yourselves now that school of thought became very, very influential uh, in, 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 in the 70s and the 80s because more and more judges, um, as it were, became influenced by, this, by, 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 by this, this analysis. Many of them were appointed under, under the Reagan administration and it became the dominant school. And um, there was then later a reaction to that school again. In other words, another correction between people who, who believed that certain of the assumptions being made by the Chicago School, and which they, as, as it were, asserted as laws of nature, were not in fact laws of nature, but were simply opinions by these people, which based on the post-Chicago post School's um, uh, thought, and Stephen Salop is probably the most influential in that, was to pr again to be proved not to be true. So while the post-Chicago school was not, was not a radical um, realignment of that school, it wasn't a callback to the, as it were, social concerns because they, they weren't, uh, they, they, don't, they don't have the, the social concerns of the early American um, um, writers and, and, and courts. They nevertheless felt that the, the Chicago school, while it had to make some correction to the earlier decisions, had overcorrected and needed to be pulled back. And so, so assumptions, particularly around the danger of vertical mergers, which the Chicago School thought was never a problem, whereas the, whereas the post-Chicago School said, well, vertical mergers can often be a problem and need to be analyzed. So that, that in, in relation to other areas of merger analysis and dominance, there was a move, in a sense, away from the kind of highly suspicious view of regulation that the state had and acceptance that regulation is an important role to play but still within a kind of a narrow economic paradigm now more recently uh, uh, there has been another school of thought post 2008 in other words why do these things occur when they do and i would suggest that post 2008 with the economic collapse that that heralded 
confidence in the market system collapsed amongst many people who up until then had had faith in markets to find their own solutions. And so what became more dominant was a school that said you needed to look more wider than say narrow microeconomics or industrial organization theory to deal with, uh, with, deal with problems created by private power. And this school of thought has always been around, but the reason it's become more influential is that post 2008, less people believe as it were in the, in, in, in whether the, the narrow economic school is working or not and are, 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 are skeptical about it. And so the voice of the, the, new, the new people, and I'll, I'll give them a label just now, but, but I'm, I just want to give the historical context first. The voice of these new people is now much loud, louder. And if you look, for instance, recently at the campaigns in the US run by uh, candidates like Elizabeth Warren, this widened notion of antitrust was very much part of her of, of her um, of, of, of her campaign, and uh, you, you might not think, well, that's why is that such a huge electoral issue? Well, because uh, antitrust can, at different times, appeal to people. It can sometimes be quite esoteric to the majority of people, but at other times has a huge appeal. So this school is now is now gaining thoughts, and I'm going to suggest that within the South African context at the moment, that school has been very much around since our origins in 1999, and is even more to the fore since we had amendments to our legislation uh, in 2019. And I'll, I'll, I'll detail those briefly. So let me now explain what the, what, what, what are the, at, at the risk of, of, of perhaps crudely putting labels on them, but it's necessary to understand sometimes where courts are going to, to, to know what, what, the, the, what the various schools stand for. Now, the, possibly the, 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 um, the school that's at the center and is, is the school concerned with well, consumer welfare. Uh, in a sense, it's been the one with the longest uh, has enjoyed the, the the longest adherence, and although it's buffeted at some time or other by the schools on either to the right or to the left of it, it very much, as it were, is the is is in the middle lane. Although it could be understood in a more expansionist or or or, or narrow or or, or, um, or narrower terms. So what what exactly is the this is the consumer welfare school now consumer welfare itself is a slightly contested issue because you will see some cases which refer to consumer welfare and and in fact they are referring to something called total welfare i'll explain the difference just now but let me give you a, a, a herbert hovenkamp is a very well-known american academic and he's 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 puts he writes beautif beautifully and let me just read how he describes consumer welfare he says Consumer welfare urges antitrust policy should encourage markets to produce output as high as is consistent with sustainable competition and prices that are accordingly as low. The consumer welfare principle is redistributive, although not necessarily in the same way as other legislative redistribution policies. It favors consumers sometimes even at the expense of technical efficiency although only when favored policy results in higher output. It does not overtly redistribute wealth between rich and poor, capital and labor, or other interest groups. The consumer welfare policy does not protect every, every interest group. For example, it opposes the interests of cartels or other competition-limiting associations who profit from lower output and higher prices. It also harms less competitive firms that need higher prices in order to survive. Market structures is, are, are relevant to antitrust policy, but it's important is contingent rather than absolute. That is, market structures are concerned when it facilitates reduced output or innovation or leads to higher prices. Now, it's a very interesting definition because you'll see that what Hoven Camp is doing is it's, it's a bit of a Goldilocks definition that consumer welfare is concerned about this, which sounds good, but it sounds as it were socially inclusive. But then it's not, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't go too far. In other words, it doesn't favor one class of persons over the others. 
So in that way, it's a bit like Goldilocks's porridge. It's not too warm, it's not too hot, and it's not too cold. For this reason, there are two other schools of thought who don't like the Goldilocks situation so as a porridge. They like either things that are too cold or too hot. So perhaps, uh, uh, and uh, depending on whether you like the theory or don't like the theory, uh, as, as to whether it's cold or hot, on the one side is this Chicago school. The Chicago school is, would, 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 doesn't see consumer welfare as the end. In other words, they see efficiency as the end. In other words, what a Chicago school person would say of a merger, which creates higher prices for consumers, but also creates greater efficiencies for the merging parties. And if those efficiencies exceed the higher prices to consumers, in other words, in the trade-off, there is a greater what economists would call total. If the total welfare is 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 greater than the loss of consumer welfare, then the the Chicago School would say that outcome is okay, because the goal they say of of of, of competition policy is that is is efficiency. It's not consumer welfare. It's sometimes consistent with consumer welfare. But at the end of the day, when the two might be in conflict, efficiency is, is the highest good. And if you look, for instance, at the South African Competition Act, and you look at the merger regime, which follows quite closely the, 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 um, the Canadian Act, if a merger creates is anti-competitive, but creates efficiency gains, which are, in the words of the South African statute, greater than and offset the anti-competitive effect, that merger, the court is obliged to approve such a merger. In other words, what you're seeing there is a statutory enactment of, in, in that situation of the acceptance of the total welfare school, the Chicago school. And I'm going to say to you that bizarrely, the South African statute is quite eclectic because it's got moments where in it, with the, with the, with the, with the uh, efficiency trade-off, which it sounds like, the total welfare uh, uh, standard is, is the standard it proves, but many other sections where there's a consumer welfare standard or, in fact, the, um, the, the, the standard of inclusion, which I'll get, to, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to now. In other words, we go right through the spectrum of, of, of values that, that, that competition laws addressed, yet still in one statute, all in one place. Now, the critique of the consumer welfare school from, from the left is that consumer welfare has fetishized economics. In other words, it's made the economist the king in the room because it's led to concepts like effects-based economics. It's led to uh, issues about uh, concern about false positives um, and less concern about false negatives. In other words, it has become the, the, the reason that, 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 that the, the, the left school critiques the consumer welfare model is that proof of anti-competitive effects has become highly technical, has usually favored those who contend there are no anti-competitive effects, because what they've done is to, as it were, make this terrain so contested that whether there's been an anti-competitive effect, if you've got a smart economist, becomes so murky that, as it were, the, the people through the competition authorities can never win. And therefore, what we've had is creeping concentration, the rise of very, very powerful firms and who competition law has done nothing about, mergers that should have been blocked, which were allowed and which went through. And there's a very interesting um, piece of work by American uh, economist called John, John Cuoco, in which he looks at the high number of mergers that have been approved in the US, um, uh, close to 75%. Uh, and Quoco says, well, looking at them post facto in an analysis, um, one wondered why they got through. But in a sense, this is the critique of the consumer welfare standard applied to mergers. Um, and, that, and that merger policy has really been weak and allowed structures of the market that are highly concentrated to come through. 
So then what then is the other plate of porridge, whether you want to call it the hot one or the cold one, where there are people, as it were, who are opposed to both the total welfare school and the consumer welfare school? Well, there isn't um, uh, necessarily an easy label to what these people are, nor an easy label as to what they want to bring into as it were, into, into the room. I mean, Re Irina referred to, um, as it were, the public interest school. That might be one way um, one would look at it in terms of the Southern Statute. They're, they're, these, these grounds are called um, public interest. Uh, and other called various names, not all of them polite. So if you were looking at the literature today, you'll see a reference to hipster antitrust. That is not meant to be a polite term, uh, even though you might think if you're a hipster, you're a really cool guy. But the term has been given by its opponents to suggest these are really cool people. It's just very trendy to be this thing, but like hipster clothing, it is superficial, transient, and will go away. A more polite label, and what the school sometimes calls itself, is the Neo-Brandeisian School. Why have they got that rather odd label? Well, it's a reference to back to Louis Brandeis, who was a very well prominent um, US Supreme Court judge uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And he's famous for a number of uh, decisions. Um, you know, if you, in public interest law, uh, he talks about sunlight being the best disinfectant. We often hear that phrase, he's the originator of that, of that phrase. When it came to antitrust law, um, uh, Brandeis was very, very suspicious of large corporations. And he, he came up with the term, the curse of bigness. And he, like the antecedents of, of, of the Sherman Act, viewed large corporations as suspiciously as large state power, as something that in a, in a, in a, in a democracy you want to be protected from and that a court should be protecting people from as well. So the school of Neo Brandeisians, even though some hundred years after he was a judge in, in, in the Supreme Court, takes upon those roots to say that there are great social dangers from the exercise of, 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 of private power. And depending on which country you, 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 you're concerned about, these concerns can generally be said to be social concerns, but the constituencies they're concerned about may be different. So in the, uh, in, in the US at the moment, there's concerns, for instance, about labor, because labor law is very, very weak in the US at the moment, unlike in this country, and therefore the um, private power can exploit labor uh, successfully without labor law intervening. And there's a sense of call uh, from these people that antitrust law can, in a sense, Right, right, that kind of imbalance. In South Africa and in other parts of Africa, there are concerns about the effect on private power about inclusion in the economy. So I think I like the term inclusion because it's very much including people in the economy who are otherwise being shoved out. But the class of people who are there to be included can range from small businesses, and I think. For most people, that would be an, ob an obvious constituency. But also in places like South Africa, it's also historical redress comes up. So in a lot of the South Africans' legislation, if you look at, look at the provisions, we're, there's a reference to historically disadvantaged persons. In other words, there's a concern that antitrust must also deal with the fact that people have historically been kept out of the economy, that the free market economy is not left to its own in some hidden invisible hand way of bringing those people in and it's legitimate to use competition law to bring those to bring those people into the economy to and um, it's a call in sense to move away from narrow notions of microeconomics narrow notions of economic efficiency to notions that we know from constitutional law like fairness fairness to firms or fairness to those individuals to be involved in the economy. Now, that's a very, very powerful school at the moment, as I explained, since 2008. And it's beyond simply um, South Africa. It's beyond Africa itself, where many African countries also adopt a similar approach, but is making a noise in the home of antitrust in the US.
So if you were to listen to the Congressional Committee of um, David, uh, Congressman David Ciccolini, or Ciccolini, I'm not sure how he pronounces it, who's the congressman in charge of, of antitrust in, in, in the House of Representatives, strong ideas about expanding into antitrust in these notions is, 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 is present and is being looked at. Now, what's, what, what would be the critique of the school? The critique of the school is that although it's all very well to talk about these values and important that they are, are they well placed in finding their solutions in competition law? In other words, yes, you've got a problem. Yes, it's an important problem, but this is the wrong tool that you're trying to use to deal with that problem. Antitrust is a tool that can do some minor duty, but it's not a heavy duty tool that you need to deal with these problems. And in particular, the critique is that there is a lack of a legal standard to deal with these problems. Whereas if you look at the consumer welfare standard and you would say, okay, the legal standard is evidence of a, a, a raise in prices or a lowering of output. That's a particular look of a standard which you can look evidence for, evidence about whether people have been excluded or not uh, by a particular conduct is very, very open. Who are those people? What evidence suffices to do that? It's, um, it's too woolly, it's too open-ended. Now, in some way, I think that critique is correct. You don't have, as it were, a very clear standard that is coming through from the, as it, the, from the, 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 the neo brandeis in school. Certainly in South Africa, there are attempts to do it through the public interest consideration in mergers and through um, what were newly introduced in 2019, which was a, a, a series of sections that dealt with the buyer, by abuse of buyer power against small firms by dominant firms that is yet to be litigated and so one can't 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 um, say what legal standard has sufficed it certainly as relation to mergers there has been some litigation but there's a reasonable critique that the litigation has often been settled in other words the public interest has often been a bargain between those who contest that the there's no public interest problem and those who say they are often brought by the government or the commission and eventually they strike a bargain to re to 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 reach an outcome but if you looked for a legal standard as to how they got there it would be very difficult to find one so in a sense in that way, perhaps the, the, the school, the public interest school, does suffer, the, as it were, the, 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 the deficiencies that its, critique, that its critiques um, say it does. Defendants of uh, the school would say, look, so are constitutional standards. So is a battle about in free speech as to what speech should be protected and when it shouldn't be protected is equally, as it were, a concept without very, very clear borders. Nevertheless, courts have to decide them and they've got to come and make some that decision. That not on its own, because the borders aren't entire boundaries aren't clear, uh, a reason to dispense with these things. And rather they say their critics in fact don't care about these issues. And that's why they're raising technical problems to say that they are difficult. All right, so let me move off having looked at the objectives of antitrust and the various what I've tried to do is to establish that there are rival and different objectives and they, they, they arise at different times and sometimes they can exist at exactly the same time as I'm suggesting happens in the South African statute and, and, and other, statutes as, uh, other statutes as well, which make the reason why antitrust is not predictable um, um, and at least understandable, if not justified. The next problems that, that occur with interpretation, in other words, I'm getting back again to these two groups of people who emerged up the, stair, up the stairway to come to the tribunal hearing and why they should both think that they've got an equally good chance of winning. So the, what, I've, what I've done so far is to go through why they might think so because of the contested objectives of, of, of competition law. The next reason is the what I would like to call, and I borrow this from um, George Stiegler, an economist of the 1950s, I, I borrow this phrase, he talks about the unhappy marriage of law and economics. Antitrust law has as its core problem, uh, dealing with market failure, 
and an attempt to try and, as it were, intervene to rectify that market failure. So in other words, it's dealing with primarily an economic problem or an economic problem with social consequences, but it has to use the legal form to try and resolve it. And in doing so, it creates a number of, 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 of notional problems. Now, the courts have done this in, 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 depending on judges' inclinations in different ways. So certain judges approach, and I, I, my colleague Richard Wish, the well-known uh, expert on, on, on European competition law, described in this way. He says, certain judges will peer at the text of a statute right up in front of their noses like this. These are the textualists. They look at the exact wording. Uh, the, the text says this and this and this, and will try and decide a case looking at the literal wording. Other judges are purposivists. In other words, they look at the, they have the text before them, but they push it away slightly in saying, what's the context in which that test, the text exists if I'm going to interpret some of these standards? If I'm going to work out what is anti-competitive effect, do I go and look at the Oxford Dictionary and saying, is this going to help me decide what, what, what anti-competitive effect is? Or am I going to think uh, uh, what is the economic problem that's being captured here and what and how do I interpret the facts in in that in that particular way so just to give you an example of of, of this from the South African experience the South African experience outlaws collusion and it says that you can have in section 4 uh, of the South African Act an agreement between all concerted practice by firms um, is prohibited if now, let me concentrate on the language of agreement between or concerted practice. Now, the term agreement is quite a loose thing in competition law. An agreement is not what contract lawyers think it is. It is much wider than that. So, Sovereign Act, it says, it includes a legally enforceable uh, 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 arrangement, but, but it doesn't have to be. So, it says a contract arrangement or understanding whether or not legally enforceable. In other words, it's gone beyond the normal common law idea of what an agreement is. Because if you came before me as a judge in a contract case in a civil court, if it didn't meet the definition of a contract, you couldn't enforce contract rights. So the statute is saying, okay, we're going beyond that enforceable right and uh, uh, of what it's expanded notion of agreement. But the, the term, the clause also outlaws a concerted practice. Now, what on earth then, if an agreement is wider than we think it is, what then is a concerted practice? And the Act says it's a cooperative or coordinated conduct between firms achieved through direct or indirect contact that replaces their independent action, but would just not amount to an agreement. In other words, there is something if we were to uh, use this visually, if this was an agreement and it went this far to the end of my pen, then a, then a concerted practice is something that where this other pen starts. So the one ends and the other one starts. And there's something that's notionally an agreement, that's my orange pen. And there's something that is a concerted practice, that is my red pen. Both are outlawed, but they are, according to this definition, a, a different concepts. Now, a textual judge would be preoccupied by the fact that there is this difference and say, you're required to decide that whether this thing is an agreement or a concerted practice, because it can't be both, because that's what the definition says. The one starts when the other ends. And this was in fact said by a judge in a case called Netstar. He said, you've got to decide which is the one or which is the other. I think that approach is wrong. I think it's too textual. And what, what critics of that judgment have said is that it actually doesn't matter because whether, where you, whether you're on the red end or the orange end of the spectrum, they are both unlawful. They are both, and the remedies for them are exactly the same. So it, it's, not a, it's not an interesting question as to whether it falls into the agreement box or into the concerted practice box, as long as it's one of this, what this thing is one of is one or the other is lawyer's preoccupation. It's not it's not really relevant uh, for the purpose of whether there's been a contravention act. Rather, the more interesting question is when you're outside that spectrum. In other words, the law doesn't allow you to use uh, section four. 
for what is called tacit agreements. In other words, if you can't show the glue by way of a, either an agreement or a, 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 a coordinated um, uh, practice that held these people together, um, you are at, in the realm, sorry, concerted practice, um, because concerted practice had ruled out independent action. But what happens if they, if, they, if they simply mimic one another without any, as it were, contact being shown or communication between sh shown before them? Now, this is often referred to by the rather clumsy, uh, tongue-twisting name called conscious parallelism. In other words, the idea that two people can actually be looking at one another uh, without ever contacting one another and following the pricing and behavior of the other. Now, lawyers being lawyers require an agreement because the idea that people, in other words, they want people to have done something bad, reach an agreement or at least imputed an agreement, draw the inference of an agreement, say, by the concerted practice. They must have done something bad so that you can help told them not to do it anymore and they can desist from it. Whereas conscious parallelism is in a sense simply rational economic acting, but without people as it were being forced to act, do anything that the law would regard as reprehensible. Now, from the Connor's point of view, apart from the moral judgment, conscious parallelism has the same effect as the agreement reached by people in the smoking room to fix prices. Both, in a sense, re result in parallel behavior between competitors to raise prices. And interestingly enough, a member of the Chicago School says, actually, that's wrong. In other words, the Chicago School, which up until now has been the school that is reluctant to intervene in the marketplace and let it sort it, itself sorted it out. Richard Posner, one of the one of the strongest proponents of that school, and uh, who was until recently a judge in the in the federal courts of America, said, in fact, the distinction is meaning is meaningless. And he says, I, I just want to quote, says, if economic evidence introduced in the case warrants an inf inference of collusive pricing, there is neither legal nor practical justification for requiring evidence that will support the further inference that the collusion was explicit rather than tacit. Certainly from an economic standpoint, it is a detail whether the collusive pricing scheme was organized and implemented in such a way as to generate evidence of actual communication. Now, many of the cases that you see around collusion are the great debate as to what was the content of agreement? What was the guy, what was the competitors doing in the room when the pricing was discussed? Was the person being charged in the room out in the bathroom at the moment when that was discussed and is he therefore off the hook? Posner actually is not interested, as you see from that quote, as to whether you need to prove the agreement. It's the collusive conduct that results. So, although Posner is a lawyer, he's very much taken the economist view of what's, what's the economic problem created by collusion and why are we obsessed by, by, um, by needing to prove the agreement. It's the effect of this arrangement that is the problem. And um, so that's a very, very interesting approach, although you won't see this being followed by courts um, uh, uh, here or any, anywhere else. They want the agreement or proof of the concerted practice. Now, let's look at this difficulty that comes up again in, in a concept like dominance. Now, in most cases, uh, we have what constitutional lawyers would think is a violation of the principle of equality. We require, we set a standard for dominant firm behavior, which we don't regard as, un, and, and say it's unlawful, when it's un, not unlawful in the case of a non-dominant firm. Now, lawyers generally, when people are treated unequally, are concerned about, is there a, a justification that for, for unequal treatment of people uh, in, in, in the law? In other words, we, we might say, for instance, that minors are not, allowed to, uh, are not allowed to drink. What's their justification? Well, there's a social justification that minors lack the maturity to drink. And there might be other uh, discriminations that, that find justification on some form of, of, 
on some form of discrimination between different people that has some rational justification. But also, most importantly to lawyers, even if there might be a dispute about the justification, is the idea that that class can easily be identified. So the class of people who are minors can easily be identified and administered because we can have reference to their ID book. Although most uh, under 18 year olds I know have managed to get hold very eagerly of fake ID documents showing them to be over 18. But, but, but be that as it may, the, pro the point is still there. Now dominance is a uh, economist don't have a problem with this idea because they understand that dominant firms are able to behave independent of market forces and thus abuse their, dom uh, their dominance because that's an economic understanding of market forces. So lawyers think that this concept is far too vague, far too amorphous to be part of a system that can be easily administered. So compromises between these two approaches result in presumptions of dominance. So if you look at the South African Act, there is a presumption that you are dominant if you hold X market share over, 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 a, particular, over, over a particular percentage. And so it goes, there are three, as it were, silos. One says that you are dominant if you're over 45% and you can't disprove it. The other says you can be rebuttably dominant if you're between 35 and 45 and uh, and below that it's for the person alleging you're dominant to say so so lawyers introduce the idea of of presumptions to assist this this amorphous category economists would say well you know even above 45 percent market share a firm may not be dominant the simply reliance on market shares is not economically justified. But this, this is in a sense represents the compromise between this unhappy marriage between law and economics when it comes to, to dominance. But the matter gets even more controversial in, in dominance cases when we look at what dominant firms can't do. So most, most systems accept that the mere possession of dominance is 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 not illegal in other words even if you've got 100 percent or whatever this market is that is not illegal most accept that you need to define dominance in relation to a market and not dominance in general simply because you're a large um, uh, conglomerate and wieldy conglomerate that doesn't make you a dominant firm you are dominant relative to where you can exercise that market power but when the idea of when you abuse that dominance is very difficult indeed because it's often difficult in dominance cases to show that there's been harm to consumers. And so often what's happened is that dominance cases use species of abuse which seek to eliminate competitors. In other words, they are ex what, 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 what competition law calls exclusionary acts. And therefore the inference is if you acted in a way that is exclusionary, you therefore by inference have, as it were, strengthened your monopoly and your ability to raise prices, even there though there may not be evidence that you in fact raise prices. Why is that evidence difficult? Because by the time a dominance case is heard, evidence of what pricing might have been or your, what economists would call a counterfactual are probably dated or non-existent. So, most of the evidence in these kinds of cases r r relates about whether that particular practice, whatever it is, it might be a loyalty discount, it might be tying up a supplier, it might be tying up a cus the customer base, it might be predatory pricing, or in some systems like in South Africa, uh, it might be excessive pricing. So all of those point to, as it were, creating an environment where you to use another economist's jargon, foreclose competitors from entry into that market. Now, that becomes a highly contested piece of terrain because the dominant firm will say, am I being held back to behave in a way which makes life easy for my competitors? Why must I, and, and I've heard one competition lawyer who is opposed to um, the idea of dominance, saying that you, it's like asking a champion racehorse to run more slowly so the other racehorses in the field can catch up with it. 
where is the reward they would say for innovation etc etc uh, by by adopting such a a, a loose limbed pathetic um, mother teresa type standard in 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 protecting co uh, competitors rather than the competitive process and you have heard that protecting uh, competition laws that to protect competitive process not competitors now what does that actually mean what does that mean in a particular court case what when when does the elimination or potential elimination of competitors amount to competitive uh, protecting the process as opposed to the individuals that's a very very hard ask in in any particular situation so um, at least in european law they have kind of developed the efficient competitor test in other words a practice is not regarded as abusive if an efficient competitor an equally efficient competitor to the dominant firm would not as it were be excluded as a result of that practice so if there's a look at a margin margin test in other words if the firm charged itself the same input price and and and, and has the the non would it survive in the marketplace if it's not well then an equally efficient firm could but it does work out in relation to other other forms of abuse and in a sense if we're saying that test is an equally efficient uh, competitor what do, what do we mean by that does it mean that it's got the same economies of scale of dominant firm well then most people objections are going to fall away because the dominant firm virtually by definition is going to have achieved those as it were static efficiencies does it mean that there are some other criteria for saying they're equally efficient and what are what what are those and that's that that would be quite controversial so the equally efficient competitor test may well be um a test that is too that is too high too set too high for for there to be actually a proper evaluation as to whether this practice is exclusionary even before one decides whether actually we want to decide uh, uh, approach it more inclusionary so dominance cases um, are, are almost the kind of hallmark where these different schools of uh, these different schools between the uh, uh, the consumer welfare school and the neo brandeisian or inclusion schools would part way quite severely because the neo brandeisian school would say the mere evidence of of exclusion is sufficient and we don't need to as it were go off into each each firm and find out whether these were losers in the marketplace they 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 never had an didn't have a clue had a bad business plan um were were buying their inputs to, were, were buying their in, inputs at too high a price they could never have made a go of it so um, these are the slow horses in the race they are the donkeys they could never they could never um, they could never survive they're saying that that would be an illegitimate evidence to be able to listen to the fact is that firms you can't look at this a uh, historically um evidence that people may enter and may enter effectively uh could be there so your frozen moment in time when you look at this evidence as to whether they are donkeys is wrong because in fact they may be not donkeys but young horses that in a few races time could actually uh give them the great race horse a good uh, a good uh, 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 compete with them very effectively but don't throw them out now at an early stage of their career so here you've got two values very very much pitted upon them and a court would have to decide court would have to be this is where courts really use that discretion is to decide whether they are protecting the competitor or protecting the process and then as it were deconstructing what that means and what evidence is sufficient for them to decide that that the process is in other words competitors are being foreclosed therefore by definition this product is 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 exclusionary therefore by definition there's less competitions and there's an anti-competitive effect in other words all these things are flowing from one uh, one one to the other and it's it's often a, a, a an area where there is no end to the kind of debate but it's important that courts in a sense lay down um a standard um in a case called Southern Airways, we lay down a standard which said that evidence of foreclosure by competitors uh, 
was like evidence of, an, uh, 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 of higher prices or uh, a, a, a decrease in supply, an evidence of an abuse of, of, of dominance. And most cases in South Africa have really turned around the foreclosure of competitors in a dominance case rather than evidence that there's been higher pricing. So it's a very, very important, and very difficult area of contestation. Certainly, I think if you're acting for the commission or your private party trying to show that there has been elimination, in order to get around this dichotomy about whether your evidence shows simply protection of a competitor rather than uh, a process, the more you can show that this uh, exclusionary behavior hasn't affected just one firm, which might be an outlier, that it generally would affect many firms um, would be the way to kind of approach your, uh, your economic evidence. So let me just now turn to the, at this stage, the presentation of economic evidence and, and, and what, 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 one of, a couple of tips that I'd like to, I'd like to give about that from, from my own experience. Now, um, I, 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 was at a, I was at a presentation at an at a, at a economic consultancy a few years ago, and um, uh, uh, people asked the senior counsel who, had, who, who was there speaking with me why courts or, or adjudicators were so seldom relying on the theories advanced by the different economists in the, in, in the case. You know? And he said, look, the problem is that, is, is that economists... Um, draw up these reports which aren't easily, easily as it were, intelligible, and therefore courts which have to make a decision go, go, go try to, um, um, would, 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 would in a sense look to the next layer of evidence, which is often intention-based evidence. What do they intend to do? How do we get to intention? We look to what are called the hot documents. What are the party's internal documents that they themselves justify this particular conduct? the dominant strategy or the reason for the merger. So in a sense, what economists must do is realize that judges have to justify their decisions. They have to justify their decisions, not to people sitting in an economic faculty. They have to justify their decision to the reasonable, intelligent person who'd like to understand why this decision was made as opposed to another decision. So the first thing is that you want reports that are advanced theories even though they may be difficult in a way that is very clear. The second is, and I always urge some economists and they, uh, without any success, is that the sh brevity is a, is, is a great gift and economists reports in these cases are seldom short but it'd be great blessing if they were. The, the third problem is a problem of, of independence. The yeah, economists come to cases supposedly as independent experts. So the law says that the independent ex expert is somebody who will give evidence as to what, what they think regardless of who called them. In other words, they'd give that same, that, uh, that same evidence. It's a kind of naive approach. It almost um, negates all sorts of psychology about the fact that people in a sense absorb and uh, the, the, the biases of who calls them, even if they're not, uh, I'm not suggesting they're dishonest people, it's just naturally what happens. Economists are in a particularly difficult situation because the facts are so open-ended in, in, in an economist case. If I compare that to my experience of independent experts in say personal injury cases, so you can have two orthopedic surgeons who are called to give evidence as to whether somebody's knee suffered a particular kind of fracture or not. So they would both basically end up looking at the same x-ray and probably reaching the same conclusion, which is why in many of those cases, the, um, the evidence is not particularly contested. They often reach agreement on most of these issues. You seldom have orthopedic surgeons coming to the witness box in the same way as economists do in, 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 in these kinds of proceedings and certainly not taking as long as they do. So it's the open-endedness problem because in a sense, the economists would say, look, this X-ray of the knee doesn't give me a full explanation. I need to go to uh, explain what's going on here, I need to go to other parts of the body or to go to other bodies. So the, the, the wide open nature uh, makes, the, makes the job of the economist very different from other experts. Uh, 
And because it's so wide open, it means that there is a degree of selectivity. What facts did you choose? To, which other x-ray did you bring into the room? Why that x-ray and not the other? And so the economist is inevitably pushed into a situation where what facts that you select to bring influenced your, your uh, uh, were justified. In other words, did you bring in those extra facts because you were trying to avoid your client from the anti-competitive effect the other person was showing or vice versa if you were acting for the commission? Why that selection of X fact as opposed to Y fact? And that inevitably makes the position of the economist, regardless of how honest that person may be, to the accusation of bias. In other words, the economist's job in these cases is far more closer to that of the lawyer, who's not expected to be independent, who's expected to be, as it were, marshal all the facts that are legally relevant that may favor their client's case and to rebut the evidence of the other client's case. So economists are caught up in this particular, particularly in their kind case of their expertise in this kind of paradox. There are ways of trying to, as it were, I think that dilemma is there. And, you know, the, the law has to just recognize it, but, but there's not much one can do about it. But the ways, there are ways of, 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 of dealing with economic, economic evidence in a way that you can actually, what's the best way to get your evidence through? The first, as I said, is to try and be brief. The next is to try and, in a sense, be shown that you've done your best to try and reach agreement with, the, with your opponent. Um, certainly in tribunal procedures, we ask experts to meet, to meet independently both of their legal counsel and their client to try and agree on, on, on certain facts, to try and agree on the data at least they're using. Is this, have the calculations been done properly? Because courts don't want to sit there and listen to you debate about whether this addition or this subtraction was done correctly. Not only are judges not particularly numerate, but they just don't, they don't have much patience either. So they want as many of those issues resolved before you come into the room. So what you want to try and do, if you, you know, obviously you're at the mercy of your opponent as to whether you can reach agreement or not um, in terms of what you, you believe, in terms of your own academic credibility, believe that you can concede or not. But assuming there are a number of points that you can't concede, what you need to do is to approach the court and say, look, these facts here are at least common cause. They're common cause between the parties. These facts here are not common cause, but we think that probably our understanding of these facts is stronger than their understanding of the facts. And then there's a third category of, of, of evidence, which, which is 50-50. You could decide either way. We don't think that there's a preponderance of evidence on either side. And there might be some other that we would concede. So what you want to do is to, as, as it were, take the court through this hierarchy of different evidence and saying, look, my theory of this case is correct because what I'm doing is I'm saying that this is common cause facts they can't, that can't be ignored. Here I've got stronger probabilities. Here, okay, we're iffy. But if you look at these two things, they match up with that thing. So in other words, what you're trying to do is you're organizing evidence in a way in which the robustness of the facts is acknowledged in different ways. Where does it stand? You'd almost draw a little... A little, a little diagram in which your common cause facts are on the bottom left-hand corner and the very iffy facts, speculative ones, are on the top right. Because courts are concerned about the robustness of evidence. That's their approach to most cases. They, they look at criminal cases about, is there, was there only one witness or was it a rainy day? And so you're in a sense saying, uh, dealing with the same sort of problem, but in relation to more abstract facts. You want to say, what is the evidence where there were several witnesses where it was a sunny day? It's in this box. The other stuff about only one, evidence, one witness and the rainy day, I'm putting the other box. And you try to explain your theory there. It's also useful to try and say, look, what, what, what the courts will say, what's the difference? I've seen 70 pages of your report, 70 pages of the other, and a whole lot of equations in the appendix. What really is the difference between your two approaches? The economists who can succinctly, but still honestly, uh, summarize what they're saying and understand what the other side is saying. Because sometimes I, 
feel that I, re- I, I needed the one side to explain to me the other side's case because they hadn't been, a, it, 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 it was by no means clear what they meant. So the economist who can do both is the economist who are going to be actually successful. Finally, and let me, let me end it now, is that courts want you to approach the job with integrity. Perhaps the most important thing to show to courts if you're getting your evidence evaluated is that they can trust you. You don't have to show that you're the smartest person in the room. You don't have to show that you're the best looking person in the room. What you want to show is that you're approaching this task, difficult it is, with integrity. And if I can finish with a quote from Abraham Lincoln and borrow it and saying, you can fool all the judges some of the time, and you can fool some of the judges all of the time, but you can't fool all the judges all the time. Thank you. Rina, if I can hand over back to you. Thank you, Norman. Thank you so much for that uh, talk. Delivered in a fashion that I think only you can uh, and making it informative and palatable both for lawyers and economists, which is no easy task. So thank you very much. I, that was thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, I really, really enjoyed listening to you. Um, and importantly also, situating it in uh, a context of history and political settlements over time and, and uh, drawing lessons from uh, what happened in the US as well. I think that was hugely uh, informative, uh, particularly for our students. Um, I see we have a, an uncharacteristically quiet audience today. Um, there is a question in the chat function and not in the Q&A uh, function. So uh, maybe Norman, for your benefit and for the benefit of the attendees who, who can't see the chat function, I'm just going to read it out. Uh, okay see uh, how you want to approach it. And I'm encouraging uh, the audience members to please type in the questions you'd like to ask Norman. This is your chance. Uh, uh, go ahead and type the questions in the Q&A function. Um, so all those questions you had about all the lawyers who had all those questions about the annoying economists and vice versa, this is the chance to, this is the chance to ask Norman about them. So we've got a question here uh, around, I think, I think uh, linking it to economic regulators. Uh, and the question is, or the comment is, in trying to reach efficiencies, economic regulators may allow price discrimination in public utilities through cross-subsidization, which is a principle that may not be supported by competition law, um, because this might be viewed as excessive pricing on the one side uh, for customers who have to pay more. So the question is, how is this unhappy marriage kept afloat in practice? So it's, it's, it's a question sort of looking at uh, sort of dual roles of economic regulators and competition policy, but also about how uh, one may look at it in a particular way, but on the other side, it may be seen as a, as a contravention. So I don't know if you want to give that a yeah. shot, Norman. Look, I, 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 think that, uh, I think it's important to distinguish between the role of, 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 a, regulated, uh, of a regulator of regulated industries and, and, and competition um, regulators. Competition regulators are generalists and they're dealing with, with, with market problems in, in, in all markets. The sector regulator is almost starting off with a premise that this market is structured in a way which doesn't allow competition and therefore needs, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really just dealing with, with, with the, and I think that as I understand the question with sector regulators who have some, some jurisdiction over the same issues that do competition regulators such as uh, ICASA and, uh, and, and ESCOM. Um, sector regulators can, um, job is to actually, their public interest job is to actually deal with inclusion. So I think it's almost unambiguous that they've got that task. It's much more ambiguous for, for a competition regulator. So their job is to actually see that, um, that the market opens up because they can do so through tools like licensing or deal with the behavior of, of a firm that is trying to exclude its rivals even if they've been licensed. So in other words, the test that they've got, the standard, the legal standard they need to meet is often much more um, facilitative to intervention than would be a competition regulator was their mandate right and usually in the it's usually in the beginning of these legislation saying to make sure that everybody can participate in the market etc cetera, etc cetera. so the public interest grounds are there but their tools are structural like licensing so i think that they start off with doing a different job in the first place and they may sometimes trade off consumer welfare to to other things but so do so do so do competition authorities <laughs> 
Thanks. Uh, thanks, Norman. We've got a few more questions coming in now. Um, there's a question around how the tribunal would go about using the inclusion standards in merger cases uh, where the text seems to call for an efficiency standard or rather. And this is what um, you were telling us or you were talking to us about earlier around um, the, the standards that are used in, in merger assessment. So if you'd like to take that question, Norman. All right. That, that's, that's a very good question. I, I think the tribunal's approach has been a, been a pragmatic one. The, the, the sort of a hierarchy approach that to mergers that the tribunal has got to do. It's got to go through three hoops. So it's got to start off deciding whether the merger is anti-competitive. So at that stage, it's wearing its consumer welfare hat and it comes to a conclusion. Assuming it's decided that there is, that this actually is harm to consumer welfare, then takes off that hat and puts on its um, total welfare efficiency school, Chicago school hat and says, um, uh, is there an efficiency gain? Now the statute makes it quite clear that it has to do that. So in other words, it doesn't have any choice in doing that. It doesn't exercise the discretion. It must do that. It's then got to come to a conclusion as to whether the efficiency gain is shown or not. In South African law, the firm has to show the efficiency. Assuming the firm either does or doesn't show the efficiency, let's, let's assume for the sake of this example that the firm says, okay, well, I've shown an efficiency gain. This would mean, absent the public interest, that that merger would be cleared. We now go to the public interest, and the public interest grounds are, are quite large, but one of them, for instance, might be the effect on small businesses. So although we don't consider consumers at the public interest stage, the effect on, cons on small businesses, so for instance, the merger might lead to this market power which might exclude small businesses. So normally what the tribunal has done, because those, those values don't necessarily directly contradict the, 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 the outcome so far, is to impose conditions on the merger rather than stopping the merger. So there have been very few mergers that have been stopped on public, in fact, I don't know if there are any that have been stopped purely on public interest grounds. The only one I'm aware of was stopped under the Banks Act by Trevor Manuel when he stopped Standard Bank and Nedbank merging. Usually it's been dealt with by, public interest conditions because there is that sort of direct opposition between the public interest grounds and the, as it were, efficiency conclusion that might have come about. Thanks, Norman. Um, just bear with me. I'm taking questions from the Q&A chat, the chat function. Questions are coming uh, through WhatsApp, so I'm constantly uh, changing screens. But I think I'll go to a question that's in, in the chat function. Um, and the question is, Considering the different economic theories uh, having been with us over the years, which theories are number one used and number two completely rejected almost a priori in South Africa? So which ones have we completely dismissed <laughs> over the years? All right, I, 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 was, I, was, I was hoping not to get that question. The answer is, and, and you may, this may be a cock out, is, is depending on which, on, which, on which you are looking at, uh, all three get, get used. So. If you're looking at uh, the merger efficiency, we're using the Chicago School. I think generally in um, vertical restrictive practice cases and, dom and abuse cases, probably the consumer, an expanded notion of consumer welfare standard would be, would, would be doing there. In other words, an expanded notion of consumer welfare and the inclusion one which come almost meet the same border. Um, the, the, the public interest in, in a cartel case is unlikely to be ever heard of there. So it doesn't enter the room in a, in a, in a cartel case, a section four case. Um, it's slightly, the inclusion standard is slightly weaker in, 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 in the dominance thing, but it's, it's certainly still there, but not as strong as it wants to be, but it's at strongest yet when we're looking at the public interest in mergers. So we've got a bit of, bit, bit, bit of each. I don't think anyone's been ruled out completely because of the way the statute is structured. Thanks, Norman. Um, back to the Q&A uh, uh, box, we've got an interesting question around um, this issue of transitional dominance uh, that we're seeing uh, as some of the uh, excessive pricing cases come through under the COVID-19 uh, yeah. disaster. So the question is around in situ so transitional dominance in situations like COVID uh, that creates uh, dominance for some firms, what would be the best or ideal approach uh, to proving and testing dominance under these um, um, circumstances? 
And maybe if I can add a little tag on, on that question, what does this uh, mean for precedence on those cases going forward once we're out of the state of emergency? Okay. I, look, I, I think that's an excellent question because I, th I, think, I, th I think that really brings these issues into being because um, it's a question of, because ultimately it does become a policy question. I think there, there was a recent tribunal case about a pharmacy that was selling um, um, uh, 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 this PPE equipment at, 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 at was considered to be excessive pricing. And the question was, uh, at least the criticism of the, and the tribunal found that they were, I forget, it, it was quite, it, it was some, some multiple of what they'd been previously charging. So the idea that with this price wasn't excessive, at least on the, on the face of it, appeared to be un, uh, uncontested. But the question was whether the firm had been proved to be dominant. And in the sense people said, and this was a real lawyer's approach, was, well, you must first establish that they are dominant before you can decide that the price is, the price is excessive. Whereas an economist would say, well, look at this pricing and how it's changed. You can't doubt that this is an excessive price. But one of the issues that you, if you were a Chicago school person, you would say, look, this dominance was so, this, this, this pricing was so temporary that the market, if you, that, that there was briefly this artificial market and it would have been responded and therefore there was no need to intervene. The other argument is to say, well, who's to say, why should consumers in this distorted market, because the, suddenly the geographic market, and that's, that's the interesting thing about these COVID cases, is that it's not the geographic market that would ordinarily be obtained. Because of government regulation, you may not be able to go to the next pharmacy to get a better product. And there may be shortages of supply. So there's a massive interference in normal market forces, which allows a firm a kind of monopoly, which otherwise wasn't a monopolist, a brief monopoly. And then your value is, do I tolerate, in other words, let the market eventually sort itself out or, uh, and therefore tolerate this brief this brief. Uh, respite so that I'm not over-regulating, or do I say, actually, this is, it, it doesn't matter. Consumers are being exploited, even if it's for five minutes, that's not allowed. You're gouging, you're taking advantage of this distortion, and you're gouging, and therefore, it doesn't matter that it's only a short period of time. Who's to say, you know, you know there's, no, there's no right period in which you can enjoy the monopoly. You cannot enjoy a monopoly, and even if it's brief, you must, you must, you must, you've contravened, you can then sort that out in the remedy as to how serious was this, how serious was it, but it's a contravention. And so my view is that the time period doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And you've got to refigure what was happening to the structure of the markets to decide on dominance. In fact, that they may not have been dominant a week before, whenever this was announced on the 26th of March, whenever this came be, being, doesn't, doesn't matter. You're looking at what there is now. Great, and then a linked question to that. Um, uh, one of the audience members is asking, um, in your opinion, has the, have the recent excessive pricing decisions, and the audience uh, has, has, has named the Discam case, um, has it made prosecuting excessive pricing cases easier? Um, or is this how excessive pricing cases were always meant to be prosecuted, um, and not the long drawn out cases we've seen that have gone, um, spanned many, many years? So do you think it's made it easier? I, I think I, I don't know if it does because I think I think it depends on on I, I, I think it's made it may, it's made it easier in the moment on the, on because the markets are subject to these constraints. I think in the and and there were also regulations around uh, that that provided during this period that that gave some advantage to the to to the commission. So I, I'm not sure if it's going to make it easier or not. I have a feeling it won't and it won't create a precedent for the other cases. Thanks. Um, then there is a question around uh, the different schools of thought. Uh, so given the different economic, various economic schools of thought and differing approaches by competition authorities from various regions, uh, such as the US and the EU, how does the competition authority, or how do the competition authorities in South Africa deal with the influence of cases from these regions on local competition cases? So I guess this is the this is the uh, you know sort of precedent um, uh, that's or cases in other countries and how we. Uh, to what degree do we do we use that in our in, in our cases in South Africa? I, th I think you know the, there's been a lot of um, criticism of the fact that we are we, we are too influenced by by um, 
precedent from, from, from both the US and from the European Union, and that our markets are different, and that um, most importantly, that entry into the markets is much more difficult in our economies, and that capital markets don't work as efficiently. So therefore, a faith, there should be much far less faith in markets than might be created through precedents in other systems. So I think that we've got to be mindful of those differences. You will look at your economy and not simply blindly follow um, what's going on in other places. So we have, for instance, adopted certain practices. Admittedly, they come from the European Union, but you don't see them in US law like excessive pricing and margin squeezing. The US doesn't like either of those and won't recognize it. But I think in, in South Africa, and I can't speak for other African countries, those have been useful tools, as it were, to attenuate the power of, of, of dominant firms. And so we haven't sort of followed the American criticism that we should use them. Same with things like price discrimination. Um, it's very unfashionable the American, uh, uh, in America at the moment to be a proponent of price discrimination. But if we're concerned about price discrimination in effect on on rival firms to the dominant firm, um, then price discrimination may be an issue that we take more seriously. In fact, there have been amendments to the South African Act um, that have gone the different direction. We've strengthened price discrimination or tried to strengthen price discrimination rather than watering it down. Yeah. Um, I'm switching to the, the chat uh, function and there's a question there around, the, is there a role for de a developmental approach to dominance and market concentration? Uh, given that we're still in an increasingly globalized world and scale is important or required for local firms to become competitive in that context. So is there a role for a more developmental approach? Um, and I guess this is also very linked to what you were talking about earlier when you were painting the history around how context matters and how the political settlement matters. Um, but yeah, you can, you can uh, give that a shot. I, 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 when they, I, I'm not quite sure whether the question is whether we would as it were, protect a, 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 as it were, an, a, a dominant firm which was in our jurisdiction uh, in order for it to, to, to be able to compete more broadly in other markets. In other words, this is what's, what was, 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 has been called for a long time the national champions ar um, argument. And um, certainly in the South African Act, there is a provision in the public interest that say, uh, that provides for, for, na for recognizing national champions in other words, you, you gain market, you're allowed to merge to get market power in the South African economy if you can say that that's going to make you more competitive abroad. Um, that in itself is, I, I don't know of any mergers where we've actually recognized that as a trade-off for an anti-competitive effect on lo local consumers. Because what you're asking local consumers saying, you played, you pay more for this particular product in order that this firm can compete more, uh, more um, better abroad and hopefully bring in tax revenues to your country, which goes to your fiscus. Certainly um, people like writers like Michael Porter said um, this was a nonsense argument and that if you can't compete well but, uh, at home, you can't compete abroad. My, my own inclination is that if you can't face the cold winds of competition locally, you won't face them in other markets, which is why South African firms who've tried to compete in other markets have sometimes been spectacularly uh, unsuccessful. So I wouldn't buy the argument that we need to protect a local firm from local market in order for it to get scale to compete somewhere else. It must win the scale for the competition. Thanks, Norman. Um, there is a, uh, a comment, quite a critical comment on the independence of economists. And the question okay. that is, <laughs> what in your view is the utility of clinging to the fiction that experts called our independent, especially in the light of the fact that in contested hearings, the Commission's own expert is often its own in-house economist who has been integrally involved in the formulation uh, and, of, and the referral uh, or recommendation of that complaint. I, I, think, I think we must separate two issues, the, the idea, the fiction that they are independent from the fact that they are useful. I think economists are actually useful to the hearing. I just find that the that the the idea that they are supposed to be independent in that in the way that the law normally requires it is a fiction that wouldn't be achieved. And I think in, in the time we just need to be honest about and saying, look, they are playing an advocacy role for their particular side. And as long as we've got, as it were, what law refers to as an equality of arms. In other words, you've got two 
equally um, um, able economists, the fact that they may be partial to the case of their particular side, I think isn't at the end of the day, the end, the end of the world. I, I think as long as they're at least intellectually honest, the fact that they may be, that there is that there is a partiality is not the end of the world. But the law requires this independent standard. That unfortunately is the law on independent experts. And I, I actually think it doesn't work in the situation, but the law is what the law is. I can't say that um, it's any different. Thanks. Um, then there's a question around promoting uh, HDPs and SMEs and uh, the question of whether there should be an inclusion defense in certain sections of the Act. Um, the ones that are listed are Section 4, 5 and 8. Um, so if uh, basically if it is an SME or an HDP firm that is being prosecuted for a contravention, should it be given more leeway than a non-SME and non-HDP? Um, so that's, 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 that's a question that's come through. All right. Um... I think the likelihood that a, that a, that a, that a, that a small a small business is going to be prosecuted for dominance is almost non-existent. So I think just by definition, it's not likely to happen. Nor are they likely to be under Section Five, which is the vertical uh, anti-competitive mm -hmm. practice, because you need some market power. So the, the question then is whether a group of small businesses or H, uh, HDI historically disadvantaged businesses were say involved in a cartel, cartel. should they get off the hook? Uh, my view is th there are some exemption exempt categories which allow cooperation for small businesses on certain things. Let's say they want to buy the input from the same place and discuss that. So there are some, um, as it were, uh, grounds in which they can cooperate and get exemptions from. But beyond that, I don't, I don't think so. Because at the end of the day, uh, collusion is the worst sin of competition law. And who, who, after all, are going to be the victims of those other than customers? In this country, customers are largely going to be black people. And in many cases, they may be economically disadvantaged people. So why prefer the one class of people who've broken the law uh, on some social ground at the expense of other people who've got to pay for it and subsidize it. Yeah. Um, there's a question which I think has already been answered, and this was around, uh, again, uh, the, uh, I think it's linked to the first question we had around uh, economic regulators, and this was the, the question around, uh, you know, is there some sort of cross-subsidization happening in network? In, oh, the difference here is they're stipulating an industry, uh, network industries, uh, which allow, in a way, for unfair treatment on some of the customers. So if there is price discrimination um, or excessive pricing to one group of customers at the expense of, of others. Um, I'm not sure if you feel you've answered this question uh, when, when it was asked in a different way uh, in the first question that we, that we tackled, Norman. If, not, if you want to add anything to that, uh, you're most welcome to. If not, we can move to, um, to another question. Well, I, I think that may, may again indicate the difference between a sector regulator and a competition regulator. Because the sector regulator may well have as a statutory mandate. Let's let's say students or get 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 or, or, as it were are required to give a great give, be given a greater discount or pensioners than uh, general consumers. I, I'm not I'm not sure if that's where the question is going. Let's let's assume that the sector regulator is requiring the companies to give lower prices to certain classes of consumers and that their way of compensating is to charge higher prices to the non, as it were, protected class of consumer. That I think is, is usually justified by the statute. In other words, the statute says, uh, if Parliament, as it were, in a political way has said, this is the objective. And so it doesn't create the problem that the competition regulator has, which doesn't have that specificity in its mandate and has to make those choices uh, as, a, as a matter of discretion as opposed to a matter, of, a matter of mandate, which the sector regulator has. Thanks, Norman. Um, I'm switching to a question that I've received by uh, via WhatsApp, so you won't have it in your screen in front of you, but I'll read it out to you. And the question is, or the comment is, in the current COVID-19 environment, where there are strong arguments for competition agencies to work with government to support industries and to protect productive assets and current jobs, how might we think about the welfare standards where some policy practices may necessarily lead to short-term losses in consumer welfare? So it's again this trade-off uh, uh, in, in, in light of the current situation that we are in COVID-19, that there are short-term welfare losses. 
I, I think, you, you know, we, we went through this in 2008 as well, when there were, when that crisis, there were, that, that came around mergers and um, in, in many markets, competition authorities were urged to get through certain mergers of firms that particularly banks were about to fail. They were sort of, virtually, you know, on one occasion, I think the authority was phoned on a Friday and told to make a decision by the Sunday on a large bank merger because they were told that the bank was going to fail. And in a sense, so in times of emergency, competition, therefore, isn't the most important policy. Other policies that might save firms or save jobs become more important. And, you know, COVID may in some times be, be that. So there is a trade-off. We, nobody can say, even, even, even those of us who are sort of competition adherents can say that's the most important thing in the world. Um, there are times when other priorities need to be done. But they, those goals need to be clear because there is danger that you get bullied into making decisions in the short term, which in the long term you realize shouldn't have been made. And they've often, after the fact, been criticisms about authorities being forced to make, to concede consumer welfare to other values like failure of fa possible failures of the firm, huge job losses, et cetera, et cetera, which have been alarmist at the time, but they're forced to, but forced to make. And, but they're very difficult calls to make because at the time you're being asked to make them, you don't have enough information and typically you have to make a very, very quick decision. Absolutely, yeah. All right, and I think the sort of last question that I see on my list um, is a follow-on question uh, with regards to the public interest uh, criteria in, in merger assessment. And the question is, um, uh, absent any specific public interest grounds being relevant for a, for a particular case, we don't apply an inclusion standard in merger cases, which is the only place that competition authorities have ex ante power to protect competition. Um, also, there is some reluctance to prohibit transactions under the public interest ground. I think this is more a comment than, than a question, but, but maybe just to hear your views on that, Norman. Well, look, um, if you were concerned about inclusion, you might actually, in a, even at the consumer welfare stage, the anti-competitive effect, let's, let's assume, I, I, I'm just trying to think of what an example, let's assume that you thought that the merger would exclude rivals of the firm. And that may well be a genuine thing to look at under the, under the consumer welfare standard, saying, look, there's going to be foreclosure of rivals if this merger takes place. And therefore, in a longer term, prices are going to rise and production is going to fall because the firm will achieve market power. So that would be a legitimate place to look at the issue of exclusion, even inclusion and exclusion. It's, 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 it's mirror opposite um, um, under a consumer welfare standard. Um, the other, so, so, so that's one door that remains open, uh, albeit a narrow one of inclusion because you're looking at whether the firms that are going to be excluded or not included have a sufficient competitive um, effect on, on, the, on, on the dominant firm. Now, I, I think a lot of the work that people like you at Cred and Simon have been doing, which I think is very interesting, is that, is that it was thought that you needed a lot of small guys out there to, as it were, say that they've got a disciplining effect on the, on the dominant firm. And I think you've, in some of your research, has actually, actually questioned that assumption. I think that's quite an important thing because you said, well, that assumption is not correct. Even a small number being excluded um, removes the discipline, the market discipline on the dominant firm. So that I think can fit into a pure consumer welfare model um, with the research being shown to, to, to rebut theories that you need a plurality of, 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 of larger uh, firms to be excluded before you do that. But it's still relevant under the public interest standard, which looks at the effect on I think it says participation of small businesses in the particular market. So it, it, the door isn't closed to it even on the public interest standard, if I'm, if I'm understanding the, correct, the question correctly. Thanks, Norman. Um, um, I think the, probably the last question that has been upvoted uh, as well, so there's more than one audience member that has that question, and this is around the views of adopting a, a per se approach to abuse of dominance conduct, um, and the, the audience member said, uh, as is done in many, many African countries uh, and proposed by many recognized authors. So what are your views on uh, adopting a per se approach, um, uh, um, a per se approach to abusive dominance conduct? And this might create more legal certainty and protect markets, 
with a sort of minimal risk of over prosecution or over enforcement, um, so to speak. So what do you have any thoughts on that? Well, in a sense, there, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, 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 what is meant by the per se approach to, 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 to dominance. Um, you, we, we've got a mixture in the South African statute. For instance, you could say that the market, the, 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 if a presumption that the irrebuttable presumption that you're dominant at over 45%, is in some way per se because the firm can't rebut that even if it hasn't got market power. So we get through perhaps one of the muddiest areas um, fairly easily for 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 the for the authority as to whether the conduct itself is is abusive. I think it depends on the nature of the particular abuse. If you look at predatory pricing. I know it's difficult to prove that, but if you there is again a kind of per se rule. So so. Historically, if you've priced what's called the Arida Turner rule, if you've published, if you price below average variable costs, you are you 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 are presumed to have abused your dominance. You can't rebut that, even if you want to lead it, lead some other evidence. Now, I know it's not easy to define the market in a dominance case. I know it's not easy to prove below your below average variable costs. Sometimes notoriously difficult, but to some extent, that's that's the closest you can get to per se under a dominance standard. But in relation to other p other things, I mean, if you were to say on excessive pricing that if you price above X above your margin, I think that would be dangerous because each industry is very different. Some the margin may be extremely low, some may be necessarily be very high. So I'd be I, I'd be careful about that. I think I think we've gone as far as we can to certainly in the South African standard to 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 have some kind of quasi per se rules, but it shouldn't be shouldn't be there for everything without getting a a lot of false positives with, with detrimental effect. Thanks, Norman. Um, I'm also uh, aware of the time. We've probably gone a little bit over uh, uh, than, than we had planned, but I think that was, that was, that was really great. And, and thank you very much for uh, your insightful thoughts uh, on, on the topic. And I'm sure our students that are participating in this lecture, listening in this lecture, really uh, got some really good insights from you. I mean, it, it's, it's a constant challenge, even for economic students to try and, and think about things within the framework of the law. So I think uh, you've set down some, some very important uh, uh, things to consider uh, for our students as well as for the rest of the audience. Um, and I think with that, I'd like to just again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for yeah. participating and, and, take, and delivering this masterclass. And we hope to see uh, much more of you uh, lecturing on our course <laughs> and, and in similar sort of platforms. So Norman, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the audience for your yeah. comments and your questions. Thank you. It's my, my pleasure. I've always enjoyed doing this. It's been a great pleasure for me. And thank you for from some very challenging questions as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye.